You know, first, I want to start by just giving my condolences to the Tobin family. I got to know Bill over these last couple of years and, and always enjoyed uh, the experience he brought to the table and the passion he brought for scouting. And um, he's been a major part of this NFL over the last half century and, and this team, you know, for a long time now. So, um, you know, I hate this for Duke and his family, but just want to give my condolences to them. Yes. Yeah, probably my favorite one. There, there can be a lot. Um, my favorite one was, was when we were on the clock with the with fifth pick in the um, 2021 draft. And we were talking about Evan McPherson. And a voice in the back of the room spoke up and said, you know, in 1985 at the Bears, we we took a rookie kicker and we went to the Super Bowl and it worked out well for us. And I just kind of remember there being a silence after that comment. And then the next thing I remember was Duke submitting the pick for – Evan McPherson, and so um, I think we were leaning that way anyway, but I, that, that comment always resonated with me, you know, and uh, he was obviously making his voice heard in that moment, and, and uh, next thing you know, Duke's, Duke's putting in Evan's name, and that's probably where Duke was headed anyway, but it's always good to, to have that last piece of advice. Just in conversations right now, Duke's just leading the charge, making sure everything's cleaned up, and um, everyone's opinions are heard, and then we get ready for Thursday. What's the, uh, the biggest lesson you've learned in six years doing it as a head coach? Sorry for many years as an assistant. What's maybe the biggest thing you walked away from or walked into the room with as a head coach? Well, it, again, the scouts do the brunt of the work, and so you want to lean on their expertise and, and their knowledge on the players just for a vision of how we utilize the player. That's that's really where I step in and the coordinators and um, being that voice. You know, if, if hey, there needs to be some closure on a player, what's the vision for him? That's that's where I've got to step in and make sure that I, I speak on behalf of our schemes and, and how we see a player fitting. And so I'm um, just leaning more into that role. Than, and then as a, as a position coach, when you're just talking about what the player's traits are as a player and how they fit you by the position group, it's got to be a bigger picture for me. I do. I, I think, you know, these, the scouting department, seeing the schemes, we, it's been similar schemes over the years. So how we, how we utilize guys and what guys succeed, which guys maybe struggle more. And so I think that's a benefit. Just, just the continuity we've had in both departments is uh, really helpful this time of year. Well, I think it's leading up to the week. You know, the, the position coaches do a great job going to the pro days and interviewing the players on Zoom and meeting with them at the combine, studying the tape. And so they supplement what the what the scouts have done. And then if there's last minute questions, you know, there's a lot of prospects. And so, you know, there, there's always cleanup work to do on each guy. And I think that's where the position coach maybe has Zoomed him one more time to try to gain some information. And so Duke may ask, you know, hey, what was your, what was your last opinion of the guy and how did it go? And, so that's maybe a week like this, that's where it pops up. You're just trying to gain all the information you can on the player. So it's, it's hard to say. There, there's always been transfers over the years. Um, and so I, you just, you're just trying to gain all the information you can on the person that you're bringing into the building and the talent level that they have and how it fits what we do. I don't think it needs to be put into a box, you know, because I think a good slot can can be a different image for a lot of different teams of how they utilize their offense and how they utilize their players. We've got a lot of players that we think can do multiple things for us. That allow you to be creative. So, you know, I'm I'm not gonna five days before the draft define what I think our top slot would look like. Uh, but I just think that we've got a lot of good people in the building that that can play multiple positions for us and allows us to to do what we need to do. 
I, I think for us, you know, we, we throw the ball quite a bit. And so the more guys you have that can do more is, is makes things easier for us. I think every receiver you watch opens up that conversation. You know, it's what's the vision for this player and how does it affect other people we have. And so that's that's probably the easiest way for me to put it. Do you have a height, weight, speed ratio? Or does that, does that change if the game evolves? Or is, it, is there something that pushes their height, weight, ratio? Height? I, I think we're always looking to be flexible. You know, it's you can see guys that maybe would fit outside of a certain criteria you may lay out. In years past, that you can just hey, the guy's a football player and, and he'll succeed, and so obviously there's always criteria we look for um, from a starting point. But you know we want football players that fit us best. I don't know that it's been let's go get this giant offensive lineman necessarily. That's just the way that it's played out. Um, you're probably most specifically thinking about Orlando a year ago. Um, we always had high regard for Orlando, and he was available, so we went and got him. And then this year with Trent, you know, it's just there was a need there, and Trent was was the best available there. And so his size is a plus, um, but it wasn't. Hey, let's go get the biggest human being we can possibly get and put there. It just coincidentally is how it played out for us. You're saying position versatility is a must for the O-linemen? Well, I'm saying in, in general, I mean, like your wide receivers can line up anywhere. Your yeah. Your offensive linemen are multiple position guys. It seems like, you know, you're, you're, you're pointing to playing the slot and outside. It seems like position versatility is almost in the world in the past. What's the exception? I think at the receiver room, just the, the way we want to utilize guys, the system I was brought up in, you know, it, it was important for guys to be able to move around. Um, number one, for offensive linemen, you can make several different arguments for that. Yeah, you want guys to have the flexibility to play multiple positions so they can compete and get on the field and the best player can play. At the same time, you know, I, I do see now more with eight active linemen as opposed to seven, which it was always, you know, you can get away with going into a game and, and carrying a one spot guy. Whereas in years past, it always had to be multiple spots if you were the sixth or seventh lineman. So whereas now you can you can get away a little bit more just based on how your training camp cut downs go of getting through some game weeks with a guy that maybe is center only or guard only and it doesn't mean that you you don't want the flexibility you want the flexibility to play multiple spots which all of our guys typically can but um, the eighth alignment has made that a little bit different. Just with, with a four-man rush, you're saying? Yeah. Well, it, you know, when, there, when there's clean wins from inside, the quarterback gets a more drastic movement than getting beat off the edge, you know, and he can just subtly push up and stay within the same framework of the footwork for the throws that we want. Um, whereas if it's a clean win from inside, that usually gets on him a little bit faster and, and causes uh, – you know, you don't always want it to cause drastic change in the footwork, but but it can because it's not as expected as feeling a rush from the outside. Zach, when did the most passionate debates happen? Was that, was that just happened? Did that happen this week? Was that at the beginning of the process when you guys sort through what you want your path to be? I'm curious, like, when, that, when the, the, the best conversations about that? I, I think, you know, it's a very civil draft room for us, and it's it's guys do a good job over the process stating uh, uh, their likes, their dislikes, and, and Duke doing a good job moderating and making sure everything's, everything's the way that he wants it done. And so um, it's a really, really clean draft room. Duke does a good job of leading and keeping everyone on task and, and uh, making sure that he's got all the opinions he needs to make decisions. No, I, I I can't remember a specific example. You're, if you're talking about draft day, before. before. No, I mean it's it's you're you're always um, 
you know, there's always guys you're passionate about. Everybody's kind of got their guy or two that they're passionate about. And, and uh, you know, the, I think the, the important thing is making sure that everyone's on the same page before draft day. You know, you don't want that to happen on draft day. And, again, that's, that's where I just give a credit to the process that the Bengals have followed long before I've been here. It's, it's a very um, – They've they've done a great job of orchestrating that draft room and um, conducting it in a way that I think the coaches really respect. You know, coaches that have been other places and jump in here, it's it's very clean is the best way to put it and organized. And um, you always have the belief that we're going to get the players that fit us the best. You don't want to take credit for your speech making the draft more chance. I don't remember any speech I gave. I, I think everybody was in. Everybody did a good job of of playing devil's advocate for other positions. I think that was needed. You know, you want to make sure it's not just this is the guy and there's not a lot of discussion. So everybody did a good job presenting arguments for, for why why you could make the argument to take other players. But um, ultimately, we were all very, very happy when this pick was submitted. It was Jamar, and, and we've certainly been happy with how it's played out. Zach, how do you think you're after the top of the first round, bottom of the first round the last couple of years, now you're right in the middle. Are there any differences between those two? The only difference is obviously uh, moving up, you know, 10 to 12 picks from from where we've done it, you know, in the past is is you maybe have a better idea of the top 18 guys than the top 29, 30, whatever it is. And so um, it might be slightly more predictable. It still feels pretty unpredictable. But um, again, we'll get to the point where we feel really good about who we're taking. I don't. I wouldn't read too much into it. Um, why I do certain ones? Sometimes it fits the schedule we have here best, and sometimes there's there's multiple prospects at multiple positions, and so you get a chance to see a little bit of everybody. Um, but I, I won't get into any specific significance other than I wouldn't read too much into that. When you meet with these guys at what night before pro day and combine top thirty visit, how soon do you know? Yes, he is what we hear about, or no, he's not. But you, you never fully know. You, you can certainly be fooled one way or the other in that. And that's what I really like our process of multiple people being involved separately with a player. And so maybe maybe you have a great or, or not so great interaction. You can go to the next person, scouts, position coach, coordinator, whatever it is, and how is yours. And then you have plenty of time to follow up after that if you need to clean up any information. But I think that's a good way of doing it is to get multiple people involved in, in multiple settings and see what the overall consensus is. I, I think it's it's hard to put something in a box like that. You know, you just – every person's different. Every person in this room is different. And so you don't want to just – because of a mistake maybe somebody made in the past, you're going to hold it against somebody you meet in the future. And so that's why you just got to do your research on the players and get a good feel for them. You know, it's, it's again, difficult – to know for certain, you know, you might hear something about a player, and maybe they just had a tough experience at college and with the people that that they were with, and and they'll be better in the NFL. The environment might be better, and vice versa. So, again, non-negotiable is a tough, tough term for me. Um, I think you've got to have some flexibility on on who you're talking about. I didn't get drafted. Uh, I played golf, you know, just to take your mind off things. I was always a full fool to get drafted, maybe in the seventh round. Um, so you you can pinpoint the moment that you need to be available. <laughs> I didn't think I needed to be available, you know, early in the morning on Sunday or whatever day it was. But I uh, um, played golf, and then I remember John Gruden called me in the seventh round, um, which was a bad sign. That when the it's usually that's that's your first red flag. They're not calling you to say we're picking you because if they're picking you, they're picking you. You know they're usually calling to say uh, we'd love to have you as a free agent because you can call plays in the huddle without messing them up. And uh, that's that's what my outcome became. No, I was at my house. Yeah. Loosely, I, I wouldn't say I study enough to have a, a firm opinion. Um, you know, I, I rely on our scouts and Brad Craig, our quarterback coach. They do all that. And so, um, you know, I talk to those guys. But I, I do like to watch the pro days. I do like to watch a couple games and get a feel for them. But 
um, to put to put the top guys in an order the way other teams would see them. I'm not I'm not ready to do that. Really good, just because again, it's not it's not a lot of new people. It's just a couple new people, um, and and with Brad, he's he's been here, so he's he's done the receivers with Troy for years, and so this isn't anything new for him. He's just getting to his natural position and being able to evaluate. So, um, not really not really a lot of newness with Brad and Jordan because they've gone through this process with us. Um, trying to think of uh, it's really all the all the primary position coaches we hired, so it's been pretty clean that way. Yeah, he, he he's pretty well involved with a lot of different groupings, and so that's a good other opinion. Another another guy who's coming in the building and, and can see things from a different perspective, and so um, he's fit in really nicely with our process. What do you make of uh, the Washington, Washington football team uh, bringing like 20 guys at once, multiple You know, I just we've got our process we believe in. Other teams have theirs, and, and so I, I'd hate to speak on what other teams are doing. An organization that was started by a head coach, do you feel like your voice and your staff's voices are considered more in the draft in comparison to some of your peers? That's a hard one for me. I Again, I just – the respect I've got for, for Duke and Mike and, and how this process is run to where um, – they want to hear everyone's voice at the right time, and everyone feels empowered. And everyone feels like what they're going to say matters, and then the people that make the decisions got to make the decisions. And so that's that's the right way to do it. And um, so I, I I like the process we follow. It's I don't want to speculate on on what everybody else is doing. Okay, thank you all.